This is the Deerfield School Committee meeting from December 8th, 2020, uh, calling it to order. Um, I thought I'd start this evening with a, a brief remembrance for a young, uh, young man, uh, Cole Baranowski, who uh, recently passed, a Frontier Regional student who also happens to be a graduate or had gone to Deerfield Elementary School. So I would ask if everyone could please join me in a moment of silence remembering Cole and his family. So we'll start with that this evening. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that, everyone. Um, okay. it's, it's a tough time of year to have this type of thing happen, but I know the Frontier community has pulled together and the, the whole Union 38 in the region has really pulled in behind the Baranowski family mm -hmm. and the other young, and the family of the young, other young people involved. So, um, so <clears throat> we're, um, Ready to roll on. We have the review and approve the minutes of November 10th, 2020. Make a motion to approve the minutes for um, November 10th, 2020. Trevor McDaniel. Second that. And David seconds. Any, did anyone have any comments or corrections or anything? Uh, hearing none. I would ask for a roll call vote of, uh, in favor of approving the minutes. Ken Cutterback, yes. Uh, David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, the financial statement <coughs> and warrants. I know we all received a financial report from Shelley, but I will turn it over at this point in time to Shelley. Great. Um, so nine warrants were reviewed, totaling $76,421.51 since the last meeting. Thank you for signing those electronically. Um, I failed to attach the uh, actual expense reports. Thank you, David, for letting me know that. I did just send them to you all. Um, there's nothing new to uh, report on. <clears throat> No new concerns from last month, but absolutely, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, the biggest update is with school lunch, which is really just a snapshot. There's no major changes since last meeting. Um, I did give you the updated revenue and expenditures. Uh, we are year to date a net income of just shy of $3,000. Um, and that is because we moved all of those wages off last month. You all agreed right. to move those right. to general funds. So we made that switch. Um, so we're looking at a positive account balance of 28000 at this point. Um, so we do anticipate that there may be a little bit of surplus month to month since we're not paying wages, um, but we'll just let that build up in the account. We don't expect it to be a huge amount, and then we'll assess whether or not we can put some wages back on here for next school year. Um, and then the only other thing is that, you know, Darius and Tina and I are in discussion about the FY22 budget. Um, we're a little bit behind compared to prior years. Normally, we would likely be presenting at least a rough draft right now at this meeting, um, but we're hoping to have that draft done for January. Obviously, we don't have any state numbers. We don't know what revenue looks like for Chapter 70 or, or anything along those lines, um, but we are moving ahead with a level service approach for next year as our first draft, meaning we're not cutting any programs. We're not reducing staff. We're looking to move forward with everything as it exists at this point, and then we'll continue conversations from there. So in the early phases of that, um, but hopefully January, we'll have some more numbers for you to take a closer look at. Okay. So. It does look like we have, um, you know, just looking at the, I guess the conference committee got together and, and it looks like they're looking at a level service as well from the state. So we'll see when that comes out. But. Pretty see what that means yeah <laughs> right <laughs> so um any any questions for shelly or is everyone pretty clear yep. um 
And, and I would, and I would say um, to Darius, thank you for sending. I don't know if the rest of the committee got it yet, but the uh, I see that the capital requests went into the town. So um, thank you for for following through on that, Shelley and Darius, to make sure it made it into the offices. Um, appreciate that. Uh, public comment. I have two um, statements that were submitted this evening. I will start with a statement from Frontier Regional and Union 38 Special Education Parent Advisory Council, um, also known as CPAC, S-E-P-A-C. Um, and because that uh, acronym is in this doc document, I just wanted to mention that that's what CPAC stands for, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Dated December 8, 2020, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council has spoken to families who had difficulty with last week's precautionary closure. We would like to share some of those concerns for this committee to consider as we all move forward. District administrators did not communicate with families or, or the CPAC about how the temporary closure would impact special education students. Our families know that DESE has urged schools to keep high priority special education students learning in person, regardless of the model the rest of the district is using. This led them to presume the district would continue to provide in-person learning to high priority students as they had with the phased reopening in September. The logistics of this transition were especially complicated for our families. Disabled students require special supervision and support that is difficult to get in place on short notice. In the midst of securing childcare, families also had to coordinate schedules with the many teachers and providers who meet with their child on a daily basis. Caregivers and teachers pieced together schedules as best they could, but many students did not get the full amount of IEP services. For those who did get services set up, the remote format was widely ineffective. The CPAC has highlighted the issues with remote learning for this population at previous school committee meetings. DESE has also acknowledged these issues and put out specific guidance to ensure disabled students are being treat treated equitably by having as much in-person learning as possible. Beyond the educational impact, we want to share with you the emotional toll on families. Disabled students rely on consistency and the sudden shift left nearly all of them struggling emotionally and behaviorally. This undue stress impacts both students and their families Oops, for weeks. In a normal year, special education families barely survive a week-long break from school after being without support all spring and summer. This extra week was unbearable. Parents' frustration grew even deeper as they learned that many teachers were working in the buildings. Their children were home having anxiety, behavioral issues, un issues unable to access their education because they were told it was safe to be in the buildings, yet teachers were on site. The optics of this sow further distrust among special education families. The CPAC board has been in communication with Darius regarding these concerns. We are hopeful that the district will resolve these issues prior to any future precautionary closures. We thank you for all your time and continued collaboration. Holly Johnson, co-chair, AJ Cerrone, uh, <clears throat> co-chair, Carrie Thurlow, treasurer, Secretary and Crystal Brown Treasurer. And the um, second, oops, I'm, I'm not finding it right now. There was a second, uh, just a moment. <laughs> Had myself all organized earlier, but I forgot where I put it. Oh, there it is. There was a second uh, note sent, and this comes from Missy and Melissa Novak Hale. Uh, dated December 6, 2020, public comment for the DES School Committee meeting 12-8-2020. Please present this comment at the DES School Committee meeting from Missy Novak of South Deerfield. I would like to share some concerns about the progression to phase three of reopening in light of the recent increases in cases, both in the Deerfield community as well as within the state. I would encourage the committee at the very least to discuss whether this is the appropriate point in time to increase the number of individuals in the school building and to consider postponing this progression to mid-January when there will be no more knowledge as to the impact of spread from both the Thanksgiving holiday 
as well as other holidays of this season, such as Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and Christmas, that are also likely to result in an increase in cases. At the Board of Health meeting last week, there was quite a bit of talk about following data, in particular data that shows that schools are not super spreaders, a situation that was part of the concern that caused schools to close in March. I get concerned when we talk about this data and don't point out that we are all part of research in motion. The data we are talking about is constantly evolving and will likely be analyzed for years to come with new insights to be learned along the way. It is unlikely we will know the true impact of our efforts to open schools for weeks or months. And when it comes to long-term assessment of learning or mental health, parents, both for in-person with mass, in for in-person in masks with distancing measures and remote close parens, those impacts may not surface for years. The truth is that the data that we know at this moment has limitations. In the earlier months of the pandemic, kids were more isolated and have become less so as the pandemic has drawn on. As we have all returned to some activities, there has been an increase in cases, quote, as of November 26th, 1.3 million children have tested positive for COVID-19 since the onset of the pandemic. The number of new child COVID-19 cases reported this week, nearly 154,000, is the highest weekly increase since the pandemic began, end quote. There is a, um, a link reference here that I'm not going to read, um, but it's, uh, I, mean, I think that's, it's referencing where the, the number was drawn from. Outside of typically private schools or larger university systems, testing has been primarily limited to symptomatic individuals. We don't know and have not at any point in this pandemic had enough testing to do widespread routine testing on everyone. If we are limiting testing to symptomatic individuals, we should now acknowledge that, quote, a recent study found that symptom screening that evaluated for all known COVID-19 symptoms and was conducted by healthcare professionals in a hospital setting, failed to identify nearly half, parens, 45% of all pediatric patients infected with the virus. It does appear that school cases are typically brought in from the community, but as the community cases increase, the risk to our teachers, staff, and children increase as well. And it is even more important that mitigation efforts are followed. I'm concerned that doubling the in-school population will impact our ability to continue mitigation efforts at the same, le same level that we have been able to sustain thus far. If we can continue to keep everyone six feet apart and masked, our chances of having less cases in school can continue to be high. The biggest concern is in navigating lunch and recess, unstructured times with an increased population in cooler weather. Outside of an arbitrary timeline and pressure from the state, I'm not sure there is a need, pressing need to increase the school population at this time in light of these concerns. If there are specific students who are struggling or have special considerations, I do think there should be space to bring these students in, in a smaller, more controlled increase in school population. Thank you for your consideration of these concerns, Missy Novak. So. Let me see if I can cleverly get back to the meeting here, and join you folks. Uh, those are the public comments that had been received uh, prior to the meeting. Um, they are both actually kind of a nice, not kind of, but a, a pretty good segue into um, item B under unfinished business. So I'd like to suggest that we sort of revamp the agenda a little bit and go to item B under unfinished business. Do we have a, I didn't, didn't notice, do we have a, 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 a representative from yeah, the Kelsey anti will be, Yep, Kelsey Kropp, I believe, is the rep coming on, and she's gonna come on at 5.30, so I've always told her like okay. a half hour, usually have a little bit more. Finance okay, talk. that's good. I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't see her yet, so um, thank you. Uh, so I just thought, Maybe that's an opportunity for us as a committee to, to talk a little bit about it. Uh, I don't know. I think I saw most names uh, at last week's Board of Health meeting. I saw Mary and Trevor. Well, Trevor was obviously there. And uh, Mary, I saw your name. And I wasn't sure if Carrie was there or not, or David. 
uh, just listening in. But I mean, there was a great deal of discussion around this whole time frame right now between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, the Board of Health did support the return to school um, under the uh, the current model that we're under. Um, we as a school have been looking at a a more robust or a transition into phase three. And so I didn't know if Darius or Tina wanted to talk to that at this point in time a little bit, and then we could maybe as a school committee discuss, it, discuss our thoughts a little bit, so. I think it'd be good if Tina, you gave a kind of an overview of <clears throat> getting everybody and everybody watching on board, where exactly is phase three, some of the statistics you've given me regarding where do we even signed up, and what does it mean about more students, quote unquote, more time, that kind of stuff? We talked prior to this, but yeah. Or anything else you want to say, Tina? Just go ahead. <laughs> no pressure. Sure. I was reaching for the mute button as you were too. Of course, <laughs> I want to talk about this. Um, just going back to what you were saying about the Board of Health meeting, Ken. Um, the prior one, prior to this Board of Health meeting, the so what was that like two weeks ago they did mention that they were putting a precautionary week of remote in place knowing that deerfield was going to go back four days a week to provide a buffer so the board of health knew that we what our plan was um right trevor yes you were on there okay Good. so um since then we've done faculty surveys i've done town hall meetings We've had um, families submit uh, the survey uh, results of what, what they would want to come back at. And surprisingly, so this is going to kind of be contrary to some of the data that was given, we have 78% of our families wanting, or children, I should say, wanting to have their kids come back four days a week. That is up from 72% um, about two weeks ago. So in the midst of all this, families are saying, they need this, the kids need it, they're excited. Um, the other thing is, if you really look at it for increasing capacity in the building, we are gonna have about 240 students in the building. That's about 50% capacity to other years. Because typically what we run at about 409, 411 students. This year we're down to 313. So if you're looking at the numbers and looking at decreasing capacity, if you will, any other year, we're one cohort when we're in full days a week, uh, four days a week. So the other thing that I want to um, mention is our mitigation um, strategies are working. Um, they're, they're, they're in place. Students are following procedures with fidelity. I had a new IA star on Monday and I asked her because I want to know where we feel comfortable. I'll, I'll speak for myself on here. I feel comfortable being in the building. I think the teachers that are in all the time feel comfortable in our building. But I wanted to know what an outside person would think when they're coming in. And she said she was so amazingly surprised that she felt comfortable. Kids, when they get up from lunch, they actually put their masks on. They remember that when they're standing, they have to have their masks on and she was surprised. And we're talking about first grade. She was in a first grade classroom. So, and then the other piece that um, uh, I, I want the committee to be aware of is nothing is changing. So lunch and recess remain the same. We're staying in our pods. We have, I have a waterfall recess schedule that I'd be happy to share with you where they're, they're scheduled way outside of like one is on the South Belt field, one is at the structure, one is behind by the pavilion. So we're not coming in contact. They're staying in their, their own pods. We're going back to staggered starts and dismissals. So we're not going to have any more children interacting or um, congested, if you will, during those high congestion times um, because we plan for that. Uh, Darius, I know that we've talked a lot. Is there anything that else that I need to highlight or that you're thinking about? Any other questions from the school committee? Uh, I, uh, this is Trevor. I just want to thank you, for you and the administration and, and the teachers and staff for, for all the planning. I mean, that, that's, it, it's, um, it's an amazing accomplishment to kind of make sure kids are not kind of interacting and they're on each side of the building and they're, you know, all the, and, and the kids are learning, you know, so well to keep, you know, safe and keep their masks on and stuff. So I just want to thank you for all that work. I know it's hard. I know the teachers are working extremely hard to, to, to teach that and to keep the kids doing that stuff. It's not easy. This whole process is miserably hard and um, you're doing a great job. So thank you. Great. Um, I, I appreciate, I'm sorry, go ahead, Darius. Well, no, I was just going to just chime in that, you know, I, 
I think we we have a pretty clear understanding of the optics of it when the numbers are up. Why are you bringing back more days? But I guess the other the argument to be had, and I guess this is the place to have that argument, is in the sense or the discussion. We have to argue. Um, <laughs> discussion is that you know numbers are up, but is the numbers in a single classroom, which is its own pod, increase the levels of risk? If we're saying it's safe to be in the building. Do, is it going an extra day in that building in that same group of students who are, you know, there's not a whole lot happening between when they go home at night and they come back in the morning. Um, you know, is that really changing the level of risk to where we feel that we should really only be doing it, you know, twice in a week rather than four times a week? Where where are they going on those off days and that kind of stuff? So that's kind of, I think, where it kind of boils down. You know, Tina and I talked about it. We, we really see, we understand that we're all concerned, just like we understand that we're all concerned should we, you know, I raised the debate, should we be in school right now with the rise in our community? And right now we're saying that as long as we can con control which populations are going into our building and being able to track the cases, um, that's where we have our confidence. I think once we can't feel it, we can't keep up with the tracking of the cases. And I say that to a board of health member that's sitting at the, at the table here tonight. Um, as soon as we aren't confident that we can track it, I think is when we have to close. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Like, we, like, like Tina, I said, it's a... a in previous conversation, it's, you know, we hear it, we see the other side, but we also say, you know, this is the other perspective on that. Um, the idea was also to, you know, the question that was brought up is why are we doing this right before the break? Why don't we just wait till after the break? Well, you know, you know, Tina talked to me about, you know, the idea that they're going to be able to work out any of the issues that they're having, you know, between now and the break. So I mean, that, that's the, that's the positive side for it. You know, the negative side is, you know, what is the, I think I've said it is, what is the increased amount of risk of, you're talking about three days, you know, we start on Monday, you're talking about three more days of contact um, over an eight day period. Um, you know, what is, you know, is that, a, is that too much? You know, I, I guess that's kind of where it's at. And I, and, you know, I think one of the discussions we had on, uh, at the Board of Health meeting was that we, we almost, you know, we, we feel like the school is a safe spot and because of all the protocols and everything that, that's happened. and and. We do worry, you know, on the days that we're not in, you know, where are the kids going? Are they going, you know, to grandma's or some other, you know, it's another family watching them. Maybe, maybe we're staying home and I'm sure some are. There's, there's a mixture of just kind of child care and what, what we're doing as far as, you know, taking care of the kids or, or helping them when they're not in this in the building. And I, you know, I almost feel like the exposure when they're in the school is safer than kind of not knowing where they go and then come back. And um, and maybe that's all figured out. And it's ju it's just a thought, you know, like it seems to work the four days. Why not the, the fifth day? Um, so um, that's kind of where we're at on that. Um, so, we are, we are watching this like a hawk. So it's not like, you know, we're going to make this decision and, and never, never go back. So every day, I mean, Carolyn's on the phone, you know, literally morning to night and um, we're managing all the other stuff with it. And so we will keep watching and working with the administration and Darius and, and our, um, and, all the you know the school nurse and the and the county nurse and our town nurse what are what's happening where can we you know do we have our hands on this and and any moment that we feel like it's beyond our fingertips we can't figure this out we take a pause and we will do that again uh, and that's difficult for the families that you know it's we heard from the first letter it's really disruptive to a lot of people and um but it, we're trying to balance that safety and education and it's really hard to do both Mary, I see you unmuted there, so go ahead. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the medical aspect of it? A couple of things. So how your processes are working in school if you have um, a teacher that needs to report a student is coughing or how that's working out. And then the second part of that is we've asked uh, parents to keep their students home. We've asked staff to stay home. And um, if they have any of the symptoms, just tell us a little bit about the impact of that. Great question, Mary. There's some there's feedback. Um, so the procedures for symptoms that are sh for children that are showing symptoms in the school are working really well. Um, the nurse comes down and get them. There's a waiting area. Uh, right now, we have a new, we, we haven't started it yet, but I know that Katie went to some training on it. We have the antigen testing, which is going to help us. Um, those, those students end up going home most of the time after a nurse assessment, and they have COVID testing before they can come back. So 
yes, if you're asking, are we sending students home on a daily basis that po that possibly do not have all of so far? Um, yes, they're going home. They're getting COVID tested. Um, we're we're kind of excited about the antigen testing. We just had a conversation on Katie, and I know that this, with Katie, and I know this is a side note because then we can get started with our contact tracing ahead of time, and we're good to go. Um, I should let you know that we have all of our seating charts in place, our lunch seating charts, our bus seating charts, so that we're, our contact tracing is set. So at any moment we can go forward with that. We have not had to use it. Um, and our staff have been fabulous. So we're able to do some remote if they're, if they're not feeling well, they can work remotely. Um, we have IAs that are, they're uh, working closely with the classroom teacher so they can step in or um, as a teacher if there's not and Elaine and I are always on call for support so so far so well and our attendance rate for teachers is high and um, the same for the students. Okay. Um, could I ask Dan could you just give a general overview of what's proposed to start now or is intended to start next week? Yeah, it looked like Darius wanted to say something. I don't know, oh, Darius, if you want to go first. I missed that. I'll give you off topic because so I was going to give an update on the antigen testing. So I'll give an overview of that afterwards. I, won't wanna, okay. I don't want to lose stride here what we, of the subject we're talking about. Okay. Just remind okay. me to do that. <clears throat> so an to. overview of next week is we're launching our remote classroom. So any family that selected remote only for their child will now have a remote classroom. And what that does is provide some consistency for that student's learning because in the model that we have now, they go to their classroom teacher and they may have students from other um, classrooms and the pacing is really hard to keep up because it's like every other day they're on. Um, and then we're going to four days a week in person. So um, classroom teachers will be responsible for those in-person students that are in, in front of them. If we go remote, they will stay with their class. Those The classroom teachers will be remoting into those in-person students and our remote classrooms will continue on as if nothing ever happened. And just as a the letter that Missy wrote, she talked about the six feet spacing and stuff. We're not. Yeah, I'm giving so, you a softball question. Thank you. Yeah, keep doing that. That's helpful. So we're continuing with, with our six feet spacing. What we did with classrooms is any classroom, if every child was to come back, if they were going to have more than 16 students, they have two spaces. So they still might only have eight students in person right now, but they still have two spaces in anticipation. Of, of more students coming back. So we are following none of our safety procedures or precautions or spacing has changed. We all have six foot social distancing. Some classrooms may only have one classroom, um, but they are, we can fit 16 desks in a classroom with the teacher with six feet social distancing. Okay. And how, many classrooms, have, how many classrooms have like close to 16 in them? Our highest number of students coming back, I believe, is 14, and we only have about two of those. I don't have um, the chart right now. Right there was an image that there were all these classrooms of 16, and that's not the correct, that's not the correct image as well. Our, um, we have about 10, I, I would say the average is 10 students per classroom in person. We're very small class sizes, which also I think the teachers are um, feeling excited about because they can meet with every student within a, in a lesson period. So. That's one thing that we can thank the pandemic for is our small groupings. <laughs> if there is a if there is a silver yeah, lining. <laughs> so, um, does anyone else have any questions or thoughts, or uh, do we just want to leave everything in place? Um, I'm I'm open to hearing what the comments are from the the committee. So, I mean, I I have just. Yeah question um and i'm sorry if i should know this is there going to be this sort of um after the break uh sort of cooling off or whatever you want to call it like there was after thanksgiving the uh well trevor you could answer as the board of health but i'll give a general view of all the boards of health how's that so that way you don't sure, speak for the board of health how's that sure. um the board of health is going to you know I'm, we're talking about whether or not we're going to have another meeting this week to look at numbers because the numbers are still um they're still going up um in the community so um, and then they were going to make a decision. They have a preset meeting for the 29th to discuss whether or not there needs to be a cooling off period after the holiday break. Right, Trevor? Right. Yes, that, that's right. And we're thinking, you know, it's a little different than Thanksgiving. There's already kind of a week built into the Christmas break. So um, 
you know, we'll just kind of evaluate at that point. We just felt it's we felt it was really good to get the four towns kind of board of health meeting. And, and, and we had a good group on the other night. So it was really nice to kind of have those conversations and have everybody on the same page. And um, uh, so we'll just evaluate it then. And again, if we need a meeting between you know the 29th and now, we'll just have a meeting anytime that, that we see it's needed or somebody calls for it. Um, but I, I think it's a little different than Thanksgiving because it'll have a built in week already. So I don't I don't know if it's a little different Thanksgiving too. you know, a lot of times you have a lot of people traveling and coming where Christmas, everyone kind of typically stays home or, you know, goes away skiing or something, but just a little bit different dynamic. Uh, I just, yeah, I think it also just goes to the point that the school actually is a pretty controlled, safe environment. So there's, I imagine there are counter arguments that, um, you know, they may be worse off at home if there is this milieu of stuff with all the, you know, families getting together. So yeah, and we, you know, the, plays into it. it was a, you know, it was kind of, a, as I said at the board of health meeting, it was kind of we've been doing trying to do everything based on data and statistics. And the the week after Thanksgiving was really almost a little bit more of a gut intention, like uh, intuition, like. There's a lot of things moving and we're seeing things happen. Should we just take a break? Because our whole goal is to keep us open as long as possible. And we felt like with that one week of remote, one with this elementary school, we could adjust and get ready for students coming back and teachers preparing their rooms for that. And then two, it just kind of gave us a little bit of idea to just kind of take a look and see what was happening in the community. But, um, you know, and, and so maybe we would make a different decision next time and not bother with a with the week off. But it's really hard to make that right decision and it's wrong for half the people yeah. typically. So yeah, but you never know. You really don't. It's, it's tough. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Thank you. A any other questions out there or thoughts? Um, I know Darius wanted to say something about the uh, testing. If you remember. I was just going to jump in. I don't have a question. I just want to say I'm. I oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm still comfortable going forward to four days a week, going to phase three. We're so lucky to have a building that can accommodate both cohorts at the same time, all the students. I don't see any reason why we can't take advantage of that. I don't see any draw. There are drawbacks, of course. I don't see any that the risk of having all the students back four days a week outweigh the risk of having all the kids home more. So I'm comfortable going forward this time. And as, as Tina pointed out, it certainly gives it gives them the opportunity to spend eight days seeing how things go um, heading into what will be, you know, the after Christmas time. So, OK, um, now we'll try Darius. Did you want to speak to the testing? Yeah, basically, the interesting testing, um, you know, we have. Um, you know, we, we are, the process is a lot slower rollout than I thought. So I kind of maybe jumped the gun by spreading the news to the community so quickly. Um, we are in the process of, I believe Meg is being trained, our nurse leaders being trained at, the, trained at the end of this week. You have to have the product from the state in order to get trained. So we're hoping we're going to receive it by the end of the week and then the first training, and then we'll be able to train our nurses going into next week. Um, there's a whole series of, we have to have permissions from parents. And so we're going to have to have an email that out and have people accept to, to do that ahead of time. One of the misconceptions about antigen testing is antigen testing, I'll, I'll break it down to my level, which is very basic, which I think people will probably appreciate, is it <clears throat> antigen is, is testing for antibodies. And so your body has to be creating antibodies in order for it to show up. It's not testing to see if you have COVID. It's testing to see if your body's reacting to COVID. And so if you're not symptomatic, that's why it's not a very... Some people are like, that's a crappy test. It is a crappy test for the, unless you have, unless you're experiencing symptoms, your body's creating antibodies. So it really, what it does is just an indicator that you, your body's creating antibodies and you have COVID so that we can move more quickly to identify um, close contacts and not have to wait two days and then have those close contacts being talked to other people and you, that kind of spread and that kind of thing. So when you send a child home, um, when you're sending a child home sick for the day, we have a, indicator right then and there because the child is symptomatic. We are not a testing site. And anytime we send someone home after taking this test, they will have to go get a PCR test. So people should, there was this concern that people were like, oh, I'll send my child to school sick so they can get tested. 
No, we're going to send you to get a PCR test no matter what. If you take the, the antigen test, either you're going to quarantine or you're going to get the test. You're going to get the PCR test where you're going to have to go somewhere else to get that. And so that part, I'm saying it out loud tonight for those watching. So it's not, it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it does allow us to move more quickly where right now if a child goes home, we have to wait 24, 48 hours for a test result to come back. And this will allow us to be able to know more quickly if we have to be doing more um, in that area or a staff member for that matter within that. And the other thing that was a missed uh, number out there is that we only get 40 tests. Um, no, we get 40 tests per kit. We're allowed up to 16 kits um, um, per place. So you know, we, got, we get quite a few. So again, it's not for mass testing. We're not gonna have everybody come in and do mass testing because it doesn't work unless your body's making antibodies for the test. And so you could lick it. It could say no, and you could have COVID. That's why you will still go get a, COVID, a full COVID test because your body may not have created enough antibodies at that point in time, may not be sick enough, so to speak, or your body's creating a slower amount of antibodies or whatever your body does when it's sick. So that's kind of in general about that. So we're, we're hoping to have, I think it's next week to be able to start to um, roll it out um, and, and, and so forth. So that's where we're at. Helpful, thank you. Thank you, Darius. Um, do we have any other thoughts or comments from the committee? Um, I just wanted to, to say that we've, we've focused largely on the um, probably the second public comment as opposed to the CPAC letter in this conversation. And uh, I know that Darius and his team are working you know, hard to try and smooth out the bumps on the uh, special education side with the high needs students and their needs and uh, at the same time work it so that it's working within the, the confines of the staffing and resources that we have available to meet those needs um, and uh, I, I'm confident that the communication will improve to that community and uh, to the, for those students and uh, services hopefully will continue to be as strong as they can be for that uh, that group of students. So, um. yeah, I can I think you you, you hit that on the head. I mean, it's a difficult. We you know we built this model that we can be able to go remote, and there are certain learners, um, and even outside of our specialized populations, um, that don't do well with remote and can't make adequate progress in remote. And we've known that, and that's why we we prioritize getting students um, back in the building for that. It is a difficult. It is a difficult thing to manage when another, an outside group, the Board of Health, is making decisions that are based on data that's live data that you can't prepare for. So we can only do so much preparation ahead of time. Um, the, 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 the concern about teachers being in the building, well, teachers can come in the building and work in an empty classroom. They're not increasing exposure. You know what I mean? So I know they were upset that teachers were allowed in the building, but students weren't. But it's not the building. It's the interactions. And, you know, so we are trying to build plans in, um, in place for those, our, you know, our most vulnerable learners um, and to get them in the buildings. But it's also, if you're closing down the building because going remote model because of the level of safety concerns, but you're having some students in, it's, a, you know, it's not as easy as just rolling out a plan and everybody says, oh, that's exactly what we have to do. So there's a lot of talking with teachers and working about, do we have to do increase any safety measures during that time. And that's what we're working out um, on the side, you know, in preparation. If there's another one coming after the uh, holiday break, um, you know, you know, if we're gonna do another shutdown, can we get those vulnerable learners in? And so we're gonna put something together so that the Board of Health can look at that and agree to not just everyone go remote, which was the first, which was last week, but can we have some exceptions to that to get some certain amount? But that's a that's a complicated balance, and I just want I want to say that out loud because it's not just that. You know, we're not listening, we're not hearing, we're not taking action, we're not caring. It's just, it's a, it's a complicated thing to move when you're talking about health issues that, you know, the staff are, are amongst those, of those people that are, um, are affected by that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Trevor, go ahead. Um, and it's, and it's, um, it is difficult because I know that, um, you know, as I sit on this committee and we're in the school environment, we're, we're, we're focused on learning. And when I wear a different hat, I'm focused on health and the health of the community. So education really isn't in my purview 
when it comes to that. Um, I, I'm, I'm really focused on just the data and the health. And um, so it, it, it is very difficult. I know in this environment, they, they go together, you know, hand in glove. Um, and, and we really care about, you know, making sure that we have those supports available you know, for that. And, and when I'm sitting at a board of health desk, I'm really just focusing on the health and I'm not really interested. I am, but my focus is on health decisions and not education decisions. So it's, it's tough to be, you know, normally you wouldn't be sitting on both boards, but uh, so it, you like, I get pulled in, in different directions, but I just, you know, to support the administration, it's the board of health is making that decision and they're not really looking at the education port part of it. Um, and and that's unfortunate, but that's really kind of we're just focusing, OK, like safety and health. And then when we get to the school committee, we're looking at how do we support those those families? Because that's really important. That's the whole reason I'm like, let's get kids back at school. So because I know how difficult it is for those families. Um, that's all. OK. Thank you. Thank you both. Ah, Mary, I see you. <laughs> Good. Um, I would just like to ask, and I think it's already starting to happen, but the increased collaboration between the Board of Health and the school committee. I know that your communication with Darius is excellent, probably almost daily. Um, but when that decision was made, I wasn't aware of the meeting. Um, and so we hear about it after the fact. Mm -hmm. Not that we, as uh, thinking of the educational part of it, would have input because it's a Board of Health thing, but I didn't have the advantage of hearing the rationale in your data. So when you run into community members, they think it was a vote of the school committee. Right. And I explained it was a vote of the Board of Health, but I couldn't really explain anything beyond that. So Perfect. I think it's important that the Board of Health communicates with the school committee as well as with Darius. Thank you for that point. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, and thank I, you. And just so everyone knows, I you know, uh, well, I'll share that Mary and I had that conversation, and I made sure that you guys were all invited to Fridays, and that in moving forward to any discussions, um, you will receive emails to invites to those meetings. Great. Thank you. And okay, any anything else, folks? If, if not, we'll. We'll go back to A under unfinished business, uh, unfinished business and welcome Kelsey, Kelsey Crop, to uh, give us an update on the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee. Welcome again, Kelsey. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, so just some kind of brief updates. Um, the, I'm sorry, my dog's shaking over there. Um, so high school has our fourth meeting with Radical Empathy Consulting out of UMass tomorrow. Um, so the last couple of sessions have been on um, social identity versus personal identity and doing that kind of self-awareness work. Um, and now we're going to start moving towards um, understanding the context of our own individual identities within the school and then how that impacts our students and kind of moving, moving towards the bigger picture from there. Um, the elementary schools at the moment are, they've completed their professional development for the, or their anti-racism professional development for the first semester. Um, they will be continuing in the second semester, focusing more on classroom implementation. Um, again, the first semester was more of that critical self-awareness work. Um, and they'll, so they'll be working with Amanda and I believe someone from um, the collaborative uh, working on, okay, now we've done that self-reflection piece. How does that translate into what this looks like in the classroom? Um, for curriculum, the eighth grade at Frontier Regional is, I believe, about halfway through stamped, um, and that's been going well. We've gotten some pushback, but over well, over, overall, it's been received pretty well, um, and there's some really, um, some really exciting conversations happening and students really engaging with that material. Um, in a very positive way. Um, and they also watched Hidden Figures right before the Thanksgiving break as part of their science and math curriculum, um, which also went over really well. Um, there were some really uh, fruitful discussions and interesting reflections that a lot of our, our young students had. So that was really cool. Um, the elementary schools have created a, a universal glossary of terms so that all, all four of the elementary schools can be using the same terms and definitions. Um, so that will be distributed shortly. 
And then five books per grade level have been selected. Um, and so those will be moving into the classrooms in the second semester as we're doing that PD with the classroom implementation. So those are books. Um, the intention is for those to be available in classrooms as like free reading um, for our like four, fourth, fifth, sixth grade or fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, um, and then sort of circle time, story time for our younger grades. Um, and all of those books feature um, characters of color um, and talk about um, themes of anti-racism and inclusion and diversity. For our school culture committee, um, we have an update from the Communities That Care Coalition about their Advancing Anti-Racism in Schools um, initiative. So in January, they are gonna be doing a district assessment of what we're already doing um, and what is already in place, um, highlighting strengths and weaknesses and giving us some recommendation for next steps. And then in February and March, they will be um, facilitating student focus groups to kind of hear from students themselves. What's your take? What do you think about your school? Um, and kind of getting feedback from students who are actually, you know, boots on the ground, so to speak. Um, and our school policy folks um, have been working on recommendations for revisions to student handbooks. And at this point, they've reached a place where they're looking for student feedback. Um, they've identified some sections that they'd really like to have student voices be heard and have students be involved um, in the writing of some of those policies, um, since this is something that impacts them on a daily basis. Um, and then they are shortly sending out a staff survey to check for understanding on our policies around um, the discipline and follow-up procedures for uh, instances of hate speech. The feedback that we've been getting is that from a discipline perspective, um, the policy is pretty solid, but we're missing sort of a, a two-prong approach where we need to be focused on the student who experienced the incident as well. Um, there needs to be a little bit more of a, a care component for them in addition to the discipline component um, for the student who was involved in the events. Um, I think that's about everything. Does anyone have questions about what's going on um, or where we're headed in the future? Is, is there also a kind of an educational um, you know, a, along with the discipline and discipline part of that hate speech, is there also kind of like a this is why and, a, and, and more of an educational part that goes along with it instead of just discipline? So I can't speak specifically to the elementary schools, but I know mm -hmm. for a fact the high school, yes. Good. That's definitely part of the, the incident. It's like, okay, you said this and, you know, you, you can't say that and this is why. Right. So I would imagine that that is also true at the elementary schools. Um, but that is also part of the purpose of the survey is to make sure to make sure that that is the case and to make sure that everyone is aware um, and is kind of following the same procedure. I think you're doing great work. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, thank you, Kelsey, for uh, that great update and uh, it sounds like real progress is being made which is nice um, look forward to hearing more as we progress through the next half of the year about how the students are reacting to the books and how the teachers are finding it um, in integrating things into the classroom so thank you thank you for coming this evening <laughs> you're very welcome thanks for having me okay uh, Let's move on to new business. The FY22 budget discussion, I think we may have already had it, did we, Shelley? <laughs> the fact that you're working on numbers and we'll have them for January. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add unless you have comments or, or questions or looking for I, other information. I, I think this is enough of an unusual year that um, certainly what, what you've laid out sounds like it will work for me and most likely it will work for the town and finance committee and board of selectmen because I'm sure they're not in their normal um, mode yet on budgets. Uh, we're, heck, we haven't even still settled the FY21 budget. <laughs> I don't think the state numbers uh, are out there, but I'm not sure you know how much more is gonna happen with them. So yep. anyways, uh, Thank you again. 
and thanks for the the report earlier. Things look good, and uh, appreciate all the work you're doing, Shelley. You and your team are doing to give us information and and everything that's going on. So appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, school improvement plan F twenty twenty one school improvement plan. Tina. So I sent that to you guys ahead of time because it's um lengthy. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of giggling because Darius said you could cut some of that out, and I was like, no, we're working on it all. I want to keep it in there. Um, <laughs> but with um, COVID and the pandemic, it, the improvement plan has been adapted to focus on some of the key indicators and the high priority um, topics that come up, such as like the anti-racism and equity. Uh, professional development that we're do doing, focusing on some of the learning gaps because of the closure, some of the social emotional needs, and also some of that community outreach so if there's any families that are struggling. So um, you'll notice that some of it is similar to last year, but then we have some new uh, goals and objectives in there. Mm -hmm. and, and the the improvement plan is put together uh, do you want to talk about how it's put, been put together and who participates? And It's just me. No, we met with the school council. Uh, the school council met. This was a year. This was a two-year plan. So we had worked with surveys and um, with the faculty and staff the year prior. We did survey families at the end of last year, I believe it was. And then I met with the school council this year, and um, we revised it together, sent it out for their approval, sent it to faculty. Okay. It's, you know, I, I think realistically, I mean, we had a disrupted year last year, so you know, really the, the mode was to pull some of the. It's a two-year plan, also because those we weren't able to complete our goals last spring. Um, right. And then you know, extending on the other work that we're doing, it's still. I think it's a little too lengthy. I told Tina that you really need to cut it down. I think, um, but they are all things that are being worked on. So it's not, it's not a laundry list of things to do. It's things that they're doing. So I think that's. Um, it's uh, impressive. <clears throat> I I agree. I think they are, there's a lot in the plan and uh, a lot that the school is that you you and your team are undertaking, Tina, um, and the community is undertaking. So, uh, congratulations on that. Do we need to vote to accept it? Correct. Um, so I don't know if people have questions or if someone would like a motion, make a motion to approve the 2020-2021 school improvement plan as presented. Or we can just be silent. Everybody's muted. Uh -oh. uh, does it need to be voted at this meeting? Uh -huh. Do we have a little time to? I mean, sure. If, we, if people want to take time to, to review it, I think we can review it next meeting. I mean, uh, vote on it next meeting. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, it would save time if we voted on it now. But uh, yeah, something uh, new. I just feel you like. Have to do, Trevor? Well, you know, I do, but and I trust that everything is in here well. But I just feel like it would be good to kind of just give it a quick read. Okay. All right. Deeper read. How about you, Carrie? Right, deeper read. See, so you're you're unmuted, Carrie. Are you meant, meaning to speak? <laughs> oh no, Just fighting with oh. the button earlier. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As so, far as the school goes, yeah, I mean, we're working on this anyway, so a week or two is not going to, or a month is not going to stop us. <laughs> and I'm speaking okay. out so of turn. What are you saying, Principal Jim? It doesn't matter if you guys vote this. We're already moving forward on it. <laughs> Technically, yes. But if you would like me to add more, Trevor. No, <laughs> no. <the> area first. <laughs> no, I, I agree. It's no, no, no. Okay. I mean, so, if, you well, think, if you want to take time to review it, that's fine. We normally do vote it in the same night, um, just because oh. it's an overview of what we're working on. But um, I'm we're fine with it. We can, we can do it next month, too. It's not a big deal. No, I, I certainly, if everyone you know feels like we're we're good to go, I'm I'm fine too. I just didn't know if other people wanted more time too. So that's all. Um, uh, it's up to well, you, Trevor. So I make a motion to approve the Deerfield Elementary School 2019-2021 school improvement plan. Second. 
and David or Carrie second. Uh, all right. And uh, any further discussion? If I if I hear none, then I'll take a vote. Uh, Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp, yes. Um, Carrie Etchells, yes. Uh, Mary Raymond, yes. Trevor yes. McDaniel, yes. Okay, we have a unanimous yes. <clears throat> Thank you all. Um, this next item, C, mural discussion. Um, I asked Tina, or Tina and I were talking about this a little bit, and I, I said, why don't we put it on the uh, agenda just to alert people. There has been a, uh, a question raised or a, a comment made on the, on the mural in the <clears throat> cafeteria entrance er, entryway. And um, there's been a great, actually a great deal of background conversation going on between Tina and Julie Cavaco and various members of the Deerfield community, um, more the historical community. Um, Tim Newman has been weighing in and others as we tried to do, as they tried to do a little bit of research. And I, I sort of came into the conversation late, um, but there was some some discussion about the mural, uh, a, a person or persons raised some questions about its uh, accuracy and whether it's appropriate and suggested, mm -hmm. you know, possibly having it removed or some, something along those lines. Um, and Tina's done a nice job, I think, of, of handling it. Tina and Julie, I should mention, who has, has really spearheaded the effort of keeping communications going. Uh, so that where we stand now is um, we're still just in the, sort of a conversation mode, I believe, Tina. Um, but Tina has looked into the possibility of moving the mural and possibly adding some, um, I, I don't know what you'd call, you know, some information that sits alongside the mural so that people can see the origins of the mural, what it's meant to represent. Um, we can see about upgrading it and various other things. But I thought it was important to let the committee know that there's sort of a background conversation taking place. Um, I have my feelings on, on the mural and uh, not just because um, I was part of the building committee and we were all in, in Mary, myself, uh, not many of the other, Elaine and, and others were, were here when the school was uh, went through the process of being approved and everything else. But uh, anyways, I, I just thought I'd let people know that there was a conversation going on in the background, um, not intended to keep it below the surface or anything else. It was something that just sort of came to Tina's desk and uh, Julie Cavaco got involved and that's where it stands. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or thoughts, um, but well, please feel free to pitch in. I have a question, just that I'm not sure if I'm supposed to know about this or not, but I really have, I have no idea what you're talking about uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that I know there's a mural, but maybe you want to say, like, why, what is the controversy or what should we take from this um, that you're telling us? Um, I, I'm not privy or I have not, I don't think I've read yet, Tina, what the original communication was on it. Maybe you could just fill in on the, on the start of the whole process. And then, I mean, the people that have been corresponding or many of, most of them are not even associated with the school at this day and age. You know, it's ranged from Doug Tierney to retired teachers that have been gone for 20 years, um, to, uh, citizens that helped with the initial efforts. So the, the mural is the one that you remember walking in, David. Um, I, I'll just fill in that, that piece of it. That mural was commissioned by Historic Deerfield um, and painted by a uh, local artist uh, named, named David Gloman, who's an Amherst College professor. Um, and David spent um, quite a bit of time uh, on the commission um, putting the mural together. <clears throat> um, and just uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tina at that point in time. <laughs> so, sure. The um, conversation is around it being an inappropriate um, depiction of history, and so what they say is the European American settlers privilege. It's a 
um, a European American settler privileged view of the colonization of America in Deerfield. So that's what's at the, the heart of it. But Julie Cavaco, um, Ken, thank you for bringing that up. Julie has spent a large amount of time researching, um, reaching out to people who are, have been in contact and really has a history of it. And the, the history, the, the bureau was meant to depict the history of the land we share as Deerfield. And she has prepared to create, create a storyline to go with the mural. Um, we do not intend to destroy the mural. Um, in some of Julie's uh, um, research, it's actually in an inappropriate, it's not in a location that it was meant to be viewed. It's intended to be viewed from a distance. So some of the conversation we're talking about is relocating it and then um, creating a new mural based on some social justice and equity values. So in the end, we'll end up with two murals. So can't go wrong with that. Sounds good. Right. So. And to David's, to David's original question, some of the excitement I think early on was there was a, an offering to paint over the mural, which obviously right. would immediately people were, there was a thing of that there's, there's more to the story than, than just uh, Native Americans on the, on, the, on the wall depicted appropriately or depicted in a different time, from a different time period, you know, that kind of. So mm -hmm. um, I think that was what got a lot of people kind of, Energies going because it was a it represents a time period in the town of Deerfield. Um, this is my educated being educated by Ken, uh, bringing the two towns basically the north and the south side of towns together under one elementary school, and that's mm -hmm. working. So there's a lot of other energies in our community, and when someone said let's paint over it, you know, so you know, we're kind of that's not going to happen, okay? And you're gonna we're going to work with with everybody and, and come to some. Uh, Sounds like Julie is well on the way to making it a teachable moment. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. I love and, that. and Tina has embraced that opportunity as well. So, right. <clears throat> so, and I've communicated with any number of people I hadn't talked to in quite a few years, <laughs> <laughs> last month. So, um, so that would that was that. Um, we're down to uh, reports. The the chair chair has nothing to report at this point in time. Um, the principal's report. We received a copy. Tina, did you want to read through it or review it, or how would you like to proceed? Sure, I'll be quick because I feel like I've gotten a lot of airtime this meeting. Um, so, hydration stations, our bubblers now are um, outfitted with water bottle filling systems, every single one of them. So, that's six of our, um, oh my gosh, bubblers. That's great. And that should be done by the end of this week. And then we have 24 smart panels that are replacing our current outdated audio visual, visual setups that we, um, were all installed last week. So we are moving forward. Chromebook updates. Um, we have not received our shipment yet. However, I've been, uh, I guess the word would be annoying, Scott. And so we are receiving all the middle school Chromebooks that do not have cameras. So every student will have uh, a Chromebook, but they might not have a camera. So I said I would take them. Nobody else wanted them. I got to him first and I annoyed him. So that's where we're at with that. Um, and I just want to shout out to our communities for partnering with us and supporting DES families. Huge thank you to Colleen Smith, our school counselor, and Nancy Trott, an educator, for soliciting, collecting, and distributing donations from our local farms, faculty, and staff and community organizations to provide over tw uh, 25 families with Thanksgiving meals. So awesome. thanks to Columbus and Deerfield, Warger Farms in Deerfield and Barway Farms were um, big donators this year. So awesome. that was a great thing. And then families have organized a car parade to show some love and appreciation for the faculty and staff tomorrow at two. So those are some of the community outreach things that are happening. That's that's great. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> and you, know, you, this time of year, thank you to your faculty, staff, your whole team. It's just amazing. Um, yeah. So, I'm glad that the community is reaching out to support you as well. <clears throat> Darius, would you like to make a report? Did you still here? <laughs> <laughs> Good on me myself. That's the first. The um, no, I don't have a report. That's fine. Okay. 
certainly the conversation we've had is is enough to update us on what you've been up to. So, um, anybody else have anything? Ken, they- if I may. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ken, um, I don't have a collaborative report. There's no oh, um, collaborative. I'm sorry. Oh, I skipped right, right over. It. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Usually, I email out if there is one. I just want to say for anyone who has not heard, Bill Deal is stepping down. He's retiring this month. Oh no. After so many years of service. Oh my gosh. Uh, wow. And he will be missed. There's, uh, Karen, yeah, Karen Reuter, she's been the acting, no, she's, she will be the acting director. She's been um, deputy director for the past se- year or so now. Uh, so she'll be taking over in the interim and then they're continuing the search for a new director. But uh, done an amazing job and we missed, but I think we're in good hands going forward. Great. Okay, thank you for that. My apologies for not, I skipped right over you. <clears throat> Ken, can I just ask a, just a really quick question? I'm just curious. Absolutely. Um, Aaron, um, you don't need to spend time on this, but just are the other elementary schools in Union 38 on the same um, schedule, school schedule in terms of um, four days a week starting up? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can kind of give you more detail on that. So um, different dynamics in different buildings. Um, and as they, they're going through them right now, um, Conway is close to already at 100, close to 100% already back four days a week. Um, because of their, their size, they were able to um, kind of evolve that way. And so it's not, a, they're doing a, they're doing the final change. Their phase three is to get everybody there was a couple of grade levels there that um, were not completely back. So it's getting those two grade levels in. Um, so they will be in the same boat as Beerfield. Waitley is still working on their plan. Um, they have some small school issues in the sense of not having enough staff to do what's happening at Beerfield. Um, we, uh, Conway being the same size school had some, had some staffing abilities that Waitley doesn't. And so they're, they're still working out what their plan is gonna be. That's gonna happen in January. And then Sunderland's an interesting one because Sunderland already has about 60 to 70 percent of their um, hybrid learners in um, four days a week. So they have 50 something of their 90 something um, uh, students who are considered vulnerable students in four days a week. So they're working on to see what that looks like, expanding that. and so they're still working on that there. So everybody's kind of in a different spot based on the different needs. But I also understand that Sunderland also is a 45-55 split, unlike um, percentage-wise. So they, they have like the closest amount of students, the most students that are remote out of all of our out of all of the schools in our district. So um, and then Frontier is um, they have a middle school and a high school, and they're trying to bring back a third day, and that's been kind of delayed going into. I think they're pushing that off to January now. So. Um, that's kind of where they're at there. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Well, if I'm not hearing any, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. And a second. Anybody unmuted? Carrie, you're unmuted. Do you want a second? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, We'll do a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? She keeps freezing up on me. Mary Raymond? Yep. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Uh, I want to wish everyone a very happy holiday season. Mm-hmm. Elaine, thank you for joining us this evening. I know you didn't get a chance to chat but uh, or talk, but um, it was good to see you're, you're online. And uh, we'll see everyone thank next you. year. Thank you.